Army Band for a wonderful performance. I'm Adam Shaw, retired Master Sergeant for the United States Army and today's MC. I would like to welcome you all to the City of Chicago's Veterans Day Commemoration Ceremony. Today and every day, we celebrate our veterans for keeping this nation, the land of the free, and the home of the brave. To all our veterans, we thank you for your valiant efforts on behalf of our country. Please join me in welcoming Alderman Gilbert Vallegas, U.S. Marine Corps veteran and Alderman of the 36th Ward. Morning, everyone. Um, Thank you for joining us today in recognition of Veterans Day. I'd like to acknowledge uh, some of my colleagues that are in attendance, Alderman Conway, Alderman Hall, Alderman Lopez, former Alderman Balser, and then also Alderman Chris Taliaferro, who's also a member of the Veterans Caucus, but isn't here today. Every, every year as we approach this day, it seems easier to find veteran-themed events, awards, sales at your favorite store. And those things are nice, but what this day means to me is it provides a moment to remember not, those who, not just those who served, but also why they served. Veterans represent the best of us, bravery, resiliency, and an unwavering commitment to service. Service for country, service for the community, and service for the public. Coming together in shared camaraderie, our military men and women come from all walks of life. From the rural country to the big city, they join forces for a common purpose, protecting our homeland, the United States of America, a country that is an ongoing experiment of democracy. Mirrored in that brilliant fact is a reminder to all citizens that there is a more that unites us than divides us. We're neighbors, community members, sharing lives together and trying to uplift one another. Here in Chicago, I'm proud to highlight numerous legislative actions that the City Council has taken in support of veterans. Just recently, we became a Purple Heart City. With this designation, of the, the, the City of Chicago reaffirms its commitment to honor and serve those Purple Heart recipients and those related to them. It is the least that we can do. Thank you. It is the least that we can do for those who gave everything they could for our country. And in the City, call, city Hall chambers, you'll see in the, in the uh, north, co north corner of City Hall, a POW MIA chair that sits there remembering those veterans that did not make it back. Additionally, earlier this year in the spring, we passed a veteran's preference for affordable housing. Often it's our community that's always talked about when talking about homeless or the unhoused. Well, this city council, this administration took action. We passed a 10% uh, affordable housing requirement out of the 20% affordable housing to make sure that veterans, those men and women that served and fought for this country, have a place to call home. Now, now I'm local alderman, all politics is local for me, so we also continue to provide space and community for veterans in the 36th Ward. In the summer, we held a Women's Veterans Day event to commemorate the unique experiences of our service women. Paired with that a resolution we passed at City Council, highlighting the 200 year history of women veterans in our military. Additionally, at the end of last week, our inaugural Heroes and Heritage event was held. This will be an annual event moving forward that spotlights the vast majority of Latin American veterans. We were pleased to be joined by Tito Puente Jr., who performs for communities nationwide while also sharing the, father, his, the, the legacy of his father, the great Tito Puente a multi-gram award-winning musician, World War II veteran, in my opinion, the best generation uh, that America has produced. His story serves as a shining example of the histories of Latinos and African Americans in the armed forces. I'm extre extremely proud of where we are today as a city and community when it comes to serving those who served us, but the work is not done yet. It is great to be here today to honor Veterans Day, but we must show up every day for our veterans. Let us continue our commitment and reiterate our gratitude for their service. Thank you to all those who have served and are currently serving our country. May God bless you and may God bless the United States of America.
Now let me introduce retired CB Chief Petty Officer Leonardo Alisea, Chaplain, United States Navy, for the invocation. Good morning. Please remove your covers if you can, and bow your heads. Dear Lord, today is the day we honor our veterans, worthy men and women who gave their best when they were called upon to serve and protect our country. We pray that you will bless them for their unselfish service and the continual struggle to preserve our freedoms, our safety, and our country's heritage for all of us. Bless them abundantly for their hardships they face for the sacrifices they made for their many different contributions to America's victories, our tyranny, and our oppression. We respect them, we thank them, we honor them, and we are very proud of them. We pray that you will watch over these special people and bless them with the peace and happiness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, Chaplain Alcea. May I ask everyone to stand for the presentation of the colors by the JROTC Chicago Public Schools Farragut High School All Service Color Guard, led by Cadet Brigadier General Verlander Tompkins III, Lane Tech High School City Corps Staff Commander. To perform our national anthem, please welcome Major D. Love, United States Army and Director of Veteran Affairs for Cook County. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we held the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that a flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet away or the land of and the home of the brave. And now, the Chicago Public Schools JROTC City Corps staff will recite the Pledge of Allegiance. Left, face, pledge of allegiance. I, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Left, face, forward, march.
Please be seated. I'd like to acknowledge our elected officials and distinguished guests who are here with us this morning, including Brandon Johnson, Mayor, City of Chicago, Clinay, oh! Clinay Headspeth, Commissioner, Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events, J.B. Pritzker, Governor, State of Illinois, Dick Durbin, United States Senator of Illinois, Tony Preckwinkle, Cook County President, Alderman Bill Conway, 34th Ward, United States Navy Reserves, Mary Frances Trucco, Director of Communications, Public Affairs and Government Relations, Jewel Osco Foundation, Trish Davies, Humble Design, Anna Valencia, City Clerk. This year, we are offering a special tribute to veterans who have served our nation during its historic war conflicts. Each of these veterans carry a unique story of courage and resilience, and we thank them for their service and for being with us here today. May I ask you to stand and be acknowledged as I call your name. Thomas Lizardo Barrios, Bariquanir, Purple Heart recipient, United States Army and Korean War veteran. Constance L. Edwards, Colonel Retired United States Army Nurse Corps, <laughs> Vietnam veteran. Wade Hudson, United States Army, Gulf War Desert Storm veteran. <laughs> Shamika White, retired United States Navy, post 9-11 veteran. <laughs> Thank you to all of you for your dedication and service to our country. As the 144th Army plays the Armed Forces Medley, I'd like to ask that attendees also please stand if you have served or are currently serving in that branch of service. The United States Marine Corps. Coast Guard.
Space Force. The Merchant Marine. the United States Army. Thank you all for your service to this country. It is now my pleasure to introduce the Governor, the governor of Illinois, J.B. Pritzker. Well, thank you very much and good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I can't thank you enough, all of you, for coming out this morning. I'm so proud of those young people in uniform, the cadets who came up here to give the Pledge of Allegiance and bring the colors. I just, I'm, I'm just so proud. I'm proud of the city of Chicago, the state of Illinois, and all the young people across our state who are engaged. Um, to all of those who we honor today, thank you. Thank you for your service. This is a day that, for me anyway, uh, gives me such great pride in America. And seeing so many of you as you stood up, veterans in our audience, who represent the various branches of service. Um, I, I just, the, I can see the pride in your faces uh, as the music is playing and as you are acknowledged by the rest of us for your service. And so thank you for giving us that on this Veterans Day. Uh, it's truly humbling to stand before our nation's bravest. America's pride is with the men and women across our nation and right here in Illinois who are assembled uh, and span multiple generations. The veterans and active duty service members here today represent every branch of our storied armed services, though I did not see anybody from Space Force <laughs> here today. Hope to see that soon. Um, uh, but your unyielding commitment uh, has uh, brought to our uh, defenses the, uh, the, the security that, that all of us want to and need to feel as Americans. Um, and you have protected all of us and especially the most vulnerable people across our city, our state, and our nation. But regardless of where or when or how you have served, whether in the Army, the Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, Merchant Marines, or the Space Force, uh, whether you were called to Europe or Asia or remained here protecting the homeland, or I guess someone went up to space, 
Um, the sacrifices that you have made, each and every one of you, have brought safety and security and comfort and prosperity to an untold number of people and their communities. And for that, this nation owes all of our soldiers an enormous debt of gratitude. You did not serve for personal laurels or commendations. Yours was service in defense of your families, your friends, your communities. You defended the freedoms of millions of Americans who you do not know and who will never meet you. But you served vigilantly to defend an idea that liberty, that equality, democracy are worth fighting for. That America, however imperfect our founders thought we might be, is the greatest nation on earth, and it's one worth fighting for. Our conflicts and alliances have changed considerably over the years, yet each generation's commitment has not wavered. From our greatest generation, our World War II veterans, to those just returning from Eastern Europe or the Middle East. Though you never shared a barracks or bunker between older and younger soldiers, you fought under the same flag and as part of the same project to maintain the freedom, peace, and prosperity that every American ought to be striving for. Our veterans, have shouldered the greatest part of that responsibility, and in doing so, have embodied so many of the values and principles that you were sent to defend. If we just look around this gathering alone, we can see the rich tapestry of our nation, of different backgrounds, religions, and experiences, featuring our veterans, but all of us, bonded by our dedication to a common cause larger, greater than any one of us. That is America. And in so many ways, your military service was just the beginning. When you returned home, you became exemplars of your communities, citizens who have upheld your responsibility and patriotic duty in the most respectful way. What pride we have in you, our neighbors, our friends, our volunteers, teachers, Little League coaches and mentors. Today, Veterans Day 2024, we thank you for all your past and continuing service and for the pride that you give us in America. And as we honor you all today, I want to remember those who made the ultimate sacrifice, those who gave their lives in service of this country and in defense of ideals greater than themselves. <laughs> To their families and friends, there are no words to express the pain of that loss or the depths of our gratitude. But know that our nation and the great state of Illinois will never forget those brave souls. We must honor them in our everyday lives, to serve one another as faithfully as they served us, and to live up to the values that they died defending. May their memories be a blessing. And as the son and grandson and brother-in-law and cousin and so on of all Navy veterans, I feel the responsibility to our military families very deeply. That's why I have made deep investments in the health and well-being of those who put their lives on the line. We have invested in better facilities, including completing and opening the long-stalled Chicago Veterans Home and building a new state-of-the-art veterans home in Quincy, Illinois. We have made in-state tuition free for veterans at public institutions, helping soldiers transition back to civilian life with the skills that will give them good-paying jobs. Beyond new facilities and resources, though, we must exhibit the values and strive for the ideals that our veterans have stood for. As you all did, we must keep the promise of America. Thank you all for your service. May God bless our veterans and active duty soldiers. God bless the land of Lincoln, and God bless the United States of America. Thank you, Governor. 
And now please welcome Senator Dick Durbin. It is an honor to be here today. I also want to say hello and best wishes from my colleague, Tammy Duckworth. Fifteen years ago, as your United States Senator, I was given a ticket to the President's State of the Union Address. And my staff said, who do you want to give it to? And I said, call Walter Reed Hospital and see if there's an Illinois veteran out there who can come and take the seat. A few minutes later, they said, we found one. It's a woman. She served in the Illinois National Guard. She was a helicopter pilot over Iraq. Her helicopter was shot down and she'll be here. That's the first I ever heard of Tammy Duckworth. A few hours later, the doors opened to my office and in full dress uniform, in comes Colonel Tammy Duckworth with her husband Brian pushing her wheelchair, both of them members of the Illinois National Guard. When I met her and spoke to her, I realized that it had only been a few weeks since her helicopter had been shot down. She'd gone through a series of surgeries and there she was, big smile on her face, as my guest. I thought, this is one of the most extraordinary people I've met in my life. We became friends. I gave her my telephone number and she became the ombudsman at Walter Reed. Next thing I'm helping sergeants from Texas and people from California, whoever Tammy ran into, she gave them my number. <laughs> but that was okay. So I called her a few weeks later and made a bold suggestion, not sure what kind of reaction she, she would make to it. I said, there's an open congressional seat in your state of Illinois, would you run for Congress? I thought she'd laugh out loud, but she said, I have to talk to my husband Brian first. <laughs> and I said, please do that. And then I had my fellow United States Senator Barack Obama call her as well and urge her to run. She says that she was in a weak moment because she was on meds at the time, <laughs> but she agreed to do it. She didn't make it in her first try for public office. She made it in her second try to Congress and ultimately in the United States Senate. My friends, I want you to take pride as people from Illinois to know that she is the strongest, most authoritative voice when it comes to veterans in Capitol Hill. She speaks for well. <laughs> And there's one other fact that Gil Villegas knows, and several people do as well. In the group of new United States Senators coming out to Washington in the next few weeks, is a Senator Ruben Gallego, who is from the state of Arizona, born and raised in the city of Chicago, back of the yards. A graduate of Kelly High School. There's another, and he'll be serving as well. He's a remarkable person. He worked hard all his life. His mom, a single, single mother raised him and he had to work all the way through his life. He's gonna be a great colleague of mine in the United States Senate. So I wanted to tell you about those people who are not here today, but who certainly should be remembered as we talk about veterans and their future. The second thing I want to do is to introduce you more specifically to a man that I was able to help about 10 years ago. His daughter contacted our office and said he never got the medals that he was entitled to by serving in, in combat. His name, Thomas Lozada. Thomas, please stand up. I want to get this point across because it came up a few weeks ago in the course of the campaign and it, it should be clarified. Thomas was born in Puerto Rico. Thomas is an American citizen. Thomas is... Thomas was one of the 4,500 Puerto Ricans who volunteered to serve in the Korean War. 1,700 of them lost their lives. Over 500 were wounded. But he came back having earned two Purple Hearts as a sergeant in the United States Army. And I sure hope I'm looking that good at 92 years of age. <laughs> It's a terrific story, almost do already. <laughs> the last thing I want to say is this. There's a new tradition in this country, and I'm glad it has really caught hold. The notion is, at major sporting events, they find a veteran, 
and salute that veteran. We all stop what we're doing, cheering the teams, stand up and applaud that veteran. He, he or she will symbolize all the men and women who have served our country. And we constantly are reminded, as we should be, of the valor and courage of these individuals. It's the right thing to do. To stand up and honor them is the right thing for America to do always. And to be there and make that part of our lives is critical to who we are as Americans. But there's one point I want to make. These men and women not only served our country to protect it, they served it to protect our Constitution and to protect our way of government and to protect our democracy. We had an election a few days ago. Did you hear about it? One third of the people eligible to vote did not register and vote. One out of three. That does not honor our veterans. We honor our veterans by using that right to vote, whatever our choice may be, and showing up for that election and casting our vote. And proud to be Americans whose rights were protected by the men and women who served us. It's an honor to be here today and salute you. Thank you, Senator. Please welcome Cook County President Tony Preckwinkle. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I want to begin by thanking all the veterans who've joined us for today's ceremony. We're indebted to you for your service, and it's my honor to be with you today. Now, the governor shared that uh, he's part of the Navy contingent of the armed forces. <laughs> So I have to say, my grandfather served in World War I, and my father served in World War II, both as members of the United States Army. So I have to say, while I'm grateful to all the members of our armed forces who've served, I have to admit that I'm a little bit partial to Army vets. <laughs> To all of the members of our armed forces, your bravery and selflessness are commendable. Six years ago, I had the privilege to be part of a ceremony celebrating the 100th anniversary of the end of World War I. It was at George Giles Post number 87 in Bronzeville. And it was a, it was a rededication of the Victory Monument placed there to honor the African-American servicemen who served in the 370th Infantry Regiment. It takes a special kind of person to serve this nation in combat half a world away, defending our principles, freedoms, and indeed our very lives. But it takes an extraordinary kind of character to do so when the country you defended doesn't consider you an equal. That was the reality faced by our African-American members of the 370th Infantry Regiment in World War I. They were fighting an enemy abroad in defense of the freedoms that their families did not enjoy at home. I think it embodies the service, the spirit of service that we see from all of those who put on the uniform today and those who have completed their service with honor. While this nation is not perfect, the things we hold dear are always worth defending. We're immensely grateful for your service. We pledge to always remember your sacrifice, patriotism, and loyalty to your country. On behalf of all of the residents of Cook County, thank you. Thank you, President Preckwinkle. I would now like to introduce Kevin Barces, Director of Veteran Affairs for the City of Chicago. Good morning. Good morning. Today, I have the honor of presenting an official resolution designating Chicago as a Purple Heart City to Lieutenant Colonel Retired Odridge Johnson, Jr. on behalf of the Military Order of the Purple Heart. <laughs> Mr. Johnson began his military career in 1967 as an enlisted helicopter mechanic. Shortly after, he deployed to Vietnam in 1969 for his first tour as an enlisted man and door gunner, but his childhood dream was to become a helicopter pilot. 
Mr. Johnson's journey to become a pilot was not an easy one. Despite being told several times that he would never become an RV, uh, Army aviator, he ignored the naysayers and remained focused on his goal. Not only did he achieve his dream, Johnson went on to become the first African-American pilot in the history of the Illinois Air National Guard. In September of 1971, during his second tour in Vietnam, this time as an officer and gunship pilot, Johnson was forced to make an emergency landing during a test flight after his Cobra gunship lost all transmission fluid. Johnson safely landed the aircraft near an enemy village before transmitting a May Day message. Aircraft returning from another mission heard the Mayday call and conducted a blocking maneuver to keep local villagers away from the scene while Johnson diagnosed the cause of his premature landing. Johnson's previous experience as a helicopter mechanic allowed him to repair his aircraft before, before, before piloting it back to his base. Along with receiving a Purple Heart, Johnson also received the Distinguished Flying Cross for his actions in Vietnam. Johnson's actions helped save the lives of his crew members while in enemy territory. Johnson continued serving in the Air National Guard until his retirement in 2002, but he continued flying Boeing 747s for the United Airlines in his civilian life. Now, on behalf of the city of Chicago and Mayor Brandon Johnson, we are proud to present this resolution to Lieutenant Colonel Retired Eldridge Johnson, Jr., on behalf of the Military Order of Purple Heart. Now it is my honor to introduce the mayor of the city of Chicago, Mayor Brandon Johnson. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kevin. And good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm grateful for Kevin's leadership as the city's director of veterans affairs. Yes, let's uh, give him a nice round of applause, Mr. Barces. And of course, I'm very proud that Chicago is now officially um, designated as a Purple Heart City and recognizing our dear brother, um, Brother Eldridge Johnson Jr. of the U.S. Army. Uh, there was just one part that was left out. Um, though he is officially bilingual now, he is a West Sider, by the way. So <laughs> West Side and South Side. Um, and in the spirit of collaboration of the West Side and the South Side, um, I do know that Governor Pritzker and Cook County Board President have very particular allegiances, but being the uniter that I am and having had relatives serve in multiple branches of government as well as multiple branches of the armed forces, uh, I am for every single uh, for armed forces, right? So <laughs> all of you are deeply a part of my heart and my tradition. But it is truly humbling and very much an honor to commemorate Veterans Day, it's, it's crucial that we not only do it on a day, but to have our veterans a part of our existence and presentations throughout the year. I'm proud that the city of Chicago, the county of Cook, and the state of Illinois carry a very proud tradition showing our immense gratitude for the women and men in the armed forces. And to all of the city council members that are here today, and particularly those who have served um, this country, our gratitude is very much profound. To the members that are gathered here today and beyond, on behalf of the city of Chicago, we do thank you for your service. Your unimaginable courage and dedication and sacrifice is why we get to live 
out our freedoms. You give us the ability to express ourselves peacefully. We're able to gather here to connect with one another, particularly at a critical time in our nation's history, as well as the globe. Now more than ever, the United States of America and our armed forces and our connectivity is essential. You give us the freedom to express our voices. You've done that today, but more importantly, we're able to express our voices without fear or intimidation. You give us the freedom to pursue our happiness, opportunities that come about in this amazing country. You also give us our freedom to understand the beauty and the joy of our shared history. Leave it to a social studies teacher to remind people that the armed forces were filled with individuals who come from respective communities in which they were not embraced. And as a fellow social studies teacher, it does give me a tremendous amount of pride and honor to know that every single major conflict, particularly here in the West, is black soldiers and black women and men who died bravely fighting for an opportunity that one day would lead to a black man running the country and a black man running the city of Chicago. You know, we thank you. We do strive to demonstrate our gratitude, not just with words, but with our actions. Chicago really is a military town. We're home to one of the most diverse veterans communities, made up of more than 65,000 service members. And throughout our city's history, brave women and men from every single corner of Chicago have fought in conflicts around the globe. They and their families deserve our support. The support to lead full and happy lives when they return home from service. The city's director of Veterans Affairs, Kevin Barces, the mayor's office of Veterans Affairs and Chicago's advisory council lead our efforts to really support our veterans. They promote services and give guidance of benefits, support veteran owned local businesses and bring together our community of veterans because that is the power of our city to be able to communicate and to connect with one another to build a better, stronger and a safer Chicago together. Additionally, my administration will remain committed to building a thriving city where all people, especially our veterans, can thrive. And that's why the investments that we have made in mental health and housing in particular are two of my top priorities. We are working hard to create accessible and equitable public mental health services throughout our city because mental health is physical health. But we're also making sure that we are building and preserving affordable housing in Chicago because every single human need, especially housing, is a human right. I hope that um, through our city's vitality and strength that our veterans can continue to return home to find happiness to feel secure, to have the life that they deserve. You know, during the Great Depression, when our country had experienced economic turmoil, our country found every single program to make life possible for men and white men in particular. It was the right thing to do, whether it was opportunities for housing, education, good paying jobs, 30% unemployment for white men during the Great Depression, and our country called it a national crisis, and it was the right thing to do. And now today, we do have an economic and a national crisis where too many people, brown and black, who have served this country do not have true economic stability. And that's why it is incumbent upon all of us to ensure that the opportunities that have been afforded as the right thing to do for women and men that we also make sure that those opportunities are afforded for brown and black women and men. Our public schools system is touching that, creating opportunities to ensure that our students can live out their full purpose, especially if they decide, decide 
to pursue opportunities in the military. But what brings me tremendous pride today is to know that Chicago has rich and deep history that has affected the globe. Today, I have a distinct honor of introducing our keynote speaker today. He's a proud Chicago veteran. His name is William J. Walker, but to put some respect on his name, we call him Major General William J. Walker. <laughs> General Walker was born and raised in Chicago. He attended St. Sabina Grammar School and Leo Catholic High School. And through his courage and love for this nation, he served as the 38th Sergeant of Arms at the U.S. House of Representatives for the 117th Congress. And previously, he was the 23rd Commanding General of the District of Columbia National Guard. He ensured that Army and Air Force units were manned and trained and equipped for any emergency. And General Walker led National Guard support to the U.S. Capitol on January 6, 2021, and subsequently commanded over 28,000 guardsmen to support Secret Service and secure the 59th presidential inauguration. General Walker is a hero. Our city is proud of him, and we thank him for his leadership and service. But not only is he a hero, he is Chicago. So please help me give a warm welcome to our brother, General Walker. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Um, I just wanted to say that, yes, um, Chicago is still in my heart. I left here in 1984. I was a DEA special agent here for two years as well. I've, I've led, uh, I've been blessed, amazingly blessed. Um, so University of Illinois at Chicago, Chicago Circle at the time, I graduated from there, and then later received a master's degree from Chicago State University. And it's one thing about the United States military, we invest in people. So the, the military, I have three master's degrees, seven graduate certificates, seven MIT, Harvard, Syracuse, all courtesy of the United States military. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. So, um, and, and just to touch on what you said about Senator, Senator Duckworth. So when she was in the Illinois National Guard, she used to drill with the District of Columbia National Guard. I, I was a colonel, and she was actually in one of the units that I had, and just amazing. So I just have to footstop what, what Senator Durbin said about that extraordinary patriot. And when she describes what happened on that fateful day when she, uh, she actually told me she thought she was landing the aircraft, but it was the co-pilot, just a remarkable patriot and senator and uh, Illinois uh, senator. So um, too bad she couldn't be here today, but she is an amazing per person. So it's, I just want to acknowledge the governor, Senator Durbin, Senator Duckworth, who is absent, um, President Preckwinkle, Mayor Johnson, and uh, commissioner, commissioner. I don't know if I've ever been on such a delightful stage in my, in my life, but I'm still young. I, uh, <laughs> we'll see what happens. But, um, you know, I was in the Illinois National Guard. That's where it all began um, 45 years ago in the Illinois National Guard at the 178-122. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> and I was an ROTC cadet then. And so to the cadets out here, Keep going. Nothing can stop you. If I can make it, you can make it too. Yeah. 
It, and I just want to share how foundational the Army is. I retired from DEA as a Deputy Assistant Administrator. I came on as a GS-7 Special Agent right here in Chicago and worked my way all the way up with what I learned as a soldier and as an Army officer. I brought that to everything I've ever done. So I'm just so thrilled, as the Governor said, to see all these cadets and the Mayor said, to see these cadets out here. So today marks 106 years since the end of World War I the Great War. At the 11th hour on the 11th day of the 11th month, guns fell silent and peace was secured. Since then, we as a nation have gathered each year to express solemn pride in the heroism of those who fought for freedom. In 1954, President Eisenhower expanded this day to all veterans, not just those who died in service, but those who lived on to continue serving in their country and in their communities. Here in Chicago, we are home to one of the largest veteran communities in our nation, 66,000 veterans. Chicago reflects the breadth and depth of service that has protected and preserved our freedoms and always will. We, and, and it was that that drove me. I, I was eight years old when I knew I wanted to be an American soldier. I, I knew it then. And, and probably nine or 10 when I knew I wanted to be a DEA agent. And that was a symbiotic relationship. I enjoyed the danger, excitement, and adventure of DEA, and I enjoyed the duty, honor, country of the United States Army. So if you are a World War II or Korean War veteran, I would ask to, you to stand if you're able. Just we want to recognize you again. And for those who served in the Cold War, which wasn't always cold, and, and those who have defended our nation since September 11, 2001, we thank you for your ongoing commitment to, to the defense and service of this nation. <laughs> Reflecting on the service of our veterans, I'm reminded of the deep values that the Army, that the military instills in all of us who serve, who, who wore the cloth of the nation. It's, you don't have to go to West Point to appreciate duty, honor, country. You, you can get it from putting on the uniform of the United States military, and, and believe me, you'll feel that way for the rest of your life. If you serve for one year, two years, or if you had the privilege, like I did, to serve and wear the uniform for 40 years. 40 years. I decided, yeah, I wore it for 40 years. So let, let me share with you a story that reflects not only the military legacy of this great city, but also the unyielding community spirit that is Chicago. As was mentioned, in the early 20th century, a remarkable chapter of military history unfolded right here in the city of Chicago. In 1914, in the heart of Brownsville, the 8th Regiment Armory was constructed, becoming the first armory in the United States built specifically for African -American, an African American regiment. This wasn't just a building of brick and mortar, it was a symbol of pride and patriotism for black soldiers who, despite facing segregation and discrimination at, at home, stepped forward to serve their country with unparalleled valor. These men, known as the Fighting Eighth, were part of the Illinois National Guard and represented the best of what America ideals could be. When the world was plunged into the darkness of World War I, the Fighting Eighth was redesignated as the 370th Infantry Regiment. Sent to Europe, they fought bravely on the front lines of French, under French command. As segregation policies at the time prevented African American soldiers from integrating with white units. But under the French, these soldiers found the opportunity to prove their worth in the unforgiving crucible of war, of ground combat. During the Meuse-Argonne offense, offensive, one of the deadliest campaigns on the war, the men of the 370th distinguished themselves with extraordinary valor and bravery. The courage did not go unnoticed, and they were awarded the Cross of Guerre one of the highest military honors given by the French government. To honor these men, a permanent tribute was erected in 1927, the Victory Monument, 
a towering granite bronze structure that still stands proudly in Brownsville today. The monument was sculpted by Leonard Cornell, and it honors the men of the 8th Regiment who fought not only for their country, but fought for the dignity and rec recognition here at home. It may be one of the only memorials in this country dedicated specifically for African-American soldiers of World War I. It's a lasting testament to their legacy. But the story of the 8th Regiment Armory doesn't end there. Like many things in life, time and neglect took their toll on this historic building. For years, the armory stood in despair. Its once proud walls crumbling, its legacy nearly forgotten. But this is Chicago. This is the city of Chicago. And it does not let history die without a fight. In the late 1990s, the community of Bronzeville came together. Veterans, civic leaders, educators, and local residents all united with one goal, to restore the 8th Regiment Armory, to honor its history, and to breathe new life into its hallowed halls. Through their dedication, this once neglected building was transformed into the Chicago Military Academy. Brownsville, a beacon of learning, and leadership for future generations. Today, the Chicago Military Academy stands as a pearl of Bronzeville, a living testament to the spirit of those who came before. Every student who walks through those doors participates in Army Junior ROTC. They learn values, the Army values, loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, and personal courage. The same values that the men of the Fighting Eighth carried with them into battle. The Academy preserves the Armory's legacy while instilling in its students the same sense of duty, pride, and courage that defined the regiment. Through this school, the memory of the Fighting Eighth lives on, not just as a story of the past, but as a living, breathing part of Chicago's future. It is a reminder that while the Armory was built for warriors, it now serves to build leaders honoring both its history and its legacy for generations to come. These same values form the backbone of the United States Armed Forces, loyalty to the Constitution, duty to fulfill our responsibilities, respect for all individuals, selfless service that puts the nation's needs first, honor in every action, integrity in every decision, and personal courage in the face of adversity. These are the foundational principles that have defined our veterans and that continue to guide our military today. But while we reflect on these values, we must also recognize the new threats we face. The world is more unpredictable than ever, with great power competition from China and Russia intensifying, Russia's invasion of Ukraine sparking the boldest conflict in Europe since World War II, and ongoing tensions with rogue regimes like Iran and North Korea. The challenges before us demand vigilance. In the, words of, in the words of Albert Einstein, the world is a dangerous place to live, not because of the people who are evil, but because of the people who don't do anything about it. Well, the, <laughs> well, the veterans here today did something about it. They stood up when called. They swore an oath to defend this country, not for themselves, but for future generations. So as we reflect on the sacrifices of our veterans, it's important to remember the enduring relevance of what President Ronald Reagan once said. Veterans know better than anyone else the price of freedom, for they have suffered the scars. We can offer them no better tribute than to protect what they have won for us. That is our duty. They have never let America down, and we must never let them down. And that's coming from President Reagan, an Illinois veteran, an Illinois veteran who served as a reservist, and then he was called to active duty. So, you know, Illinois is where it all starts, in my mind. <laughs> President Reagan's words <laughs> resonate deeply, especially today. Veterans understand in ways perhaps only they can. The weight of the sacrifices made on the front lines in the quiet moments of service and in the lives forever changed by conflict, 
They have carried the scars of war, some visible, some invisible, and have borne the burden of defending the freedoms that we enjoy. The tribute we owe them is not just gratitude, but action. It's like the mayor talked about, action. It's all about getting things accomplished. The tribute we owe them is endless. We, the freedoms that they fought to secure to uphold the values of liberty, democracy, and justice. If veterans have never let America down, we must ensure that their sacrifices are not in vain by defending what they have passed down to us. This is the legacy of our veterans, a legacy of sacrifice, honor, and an unbreakable commitment to the ideals of this great nation. It's a legacy we must preserve through our own vigilance, through our own dedication to upholding the freedoms that they secured for all of us. As, uh, yet as fellow Americans, yet as fewer Americans serve in uniform, it's more important than ever that we as a society remain connected to our military and, and those who defend our freedoms. The all-volunteer force, which is 51 years old, has created the finest military the world has ever known in the history of mankind. You know. <laughs> the burden of service falls on fewer and fewer shoulders. It is up to us, veterans and civilians alike, to honor the, value, the values of service and ensure that future generations understand the price of freedom. As we honor our veterans today, let us also honor the sacrifices of our first responders. Mayor, I send my heartfelt condolences on the police officers that you lost last week. And this year has been a terrible year. Like I said, I was a DEA special agent here. I work with the Chicago Police Department. And I'm just I'm, I'm deeply saddened by, by all the police officers that have been killed, not just here in Chicago, but everywhere. So the first responders, as our military, we, we must honor their sacrifice and their courage. Their commitment to serve and protect uh, reflects the same values of duty honor, country, and selfless service that the United States military has. As President Reagan reminded us, they never let, again, they never let America down. We can never let them down. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your service. May God bless our veterans. May God bless our troops still in, this, in the fight. May God bless our first responders. And may God always bless the United States of America. Thank you, Major General William J. Walker. It is important for us to continue to show our support for our veterans after they return home. In recognition of this, the Jewel Osco Foundation is here to provide a local veterans organization a monetary contribution to continue their necessary work. Please welcome Mary Frances Trucco, Director of Communications, Public Affairs, and Government Relations of the Jewel Osco Foundation. Thank you for allowing uh, Jewel Osco to be part of this event today, and thank you to all of our veterans for their service. Partnering with local veterans organizations is one of the pillars of the Jewel Osco Foundation. We have supported many organizations in the Chicagoland area with monetary in-kind donations. Name of the USO Midwest Chapter, VFWs, Midwest Veterans, Shelter for the Homeless Veterans, Operation Support Our Troops, Canines for Veterans, and the Rush Road Home Program. We've also hired veterans, many of whom have called Jewel Osco their second career because of many opportunities, employment opportunities that we have. For several years, Jewel Osco has partnered with Humble Design Chicago, an organization that works with formerly unhoused veterans and families by designing and furnishing homes and apartments at no cost that they, the individuals have secured. Humble Design is an amazing organization and Jewel Osco has had the pleasure of volunteering by helping and cleaning and furnishing and stocking the pantries of quite a few homes over the past couple of years. Today I am proud to present a $25,000 check to Humble Design. <laughs> And introduce Chris Davies, who's the Executive Director of Humble Design. Thank you so much. And thank you for having us here today. Uh, <clears throat> to give a bit of background, uh, my name is Trish Davies. I'm the Executive Director of Humble Design. 
where we are transforming lives in communities across Chicago. We serve veterans and families who are emerging from homelessness by transforming houses into warm and welcoming homes using donated furniture and household goods. As someone who grew up in a family where every generation has served and as a proud mother uh, of an army soldier, I cannot overstate how important this is for our veterans. Securing housing is a critical first step. Unfortunately, it is not enough. With our services, individuals are able to establish stability by mitigating the high cost of moving in and setting up a new home. To provide some context, it would take our average humble client 18 years to fully furnish a home in the way that we do during one of our so-called deco days. By the time our team completes our job for the day, the client has the cookware to make their first meal. They have a table and chairs at which to eat, a living room to gather in, and a bed to sleep that night. It is life-changing. What's more, everything we do comes from a point of collaboration with social service agencies who provide the referrals, with volunteers who drive our mission, and with community-centered uh, companies like Jewel Osco. Jewel Osco has been more than a grocery store in this community for so long. They've been a trusted partner who is committed to creating stronger neighborhoods uh, that serve all of us. So today, I thank you, Mary Frances, for the donation, but also the partnership. Because in addition to the financial support, the Jewel Osco team comes out time and again to bring their, give their time and sweat <laughs> turning around a home for our veterans. Uh, together, we continue to have a profound impact on the lives of veterans we serve, enabling them to settle into their homes and their communities where they can establish long-term connections and stability, something that is essential for a bright and hopeful future. Thank you. I would now like to welcome back Chaplain Alisea to give the benediction. A purple medal, a badge of honor, a badge of military merit for wounds received and lives lost, given to those who gave themselves so others to be saved. A purple medal, a sword, a shield deflecting the bullet of the bomb, the very the hurt meant for another. Bravery without thinking first of themselves. A purple medal worn over the heart, a medal that is shield either keeping our memories from coming out or blocking those memories from getting inside. A purple medal. Is it enough itself or to reward the hero? Not by itself, it takes comrades, government, citizens to all to speak one voice, to speak the words loud and clear. Thank you, brave soldier. A purple medal, now let's take a moment to think about the cost of earning that purple medal that hangs over the heart. If your tradition is to pray, do so and say a prayer for those who earn the purple heart. If your tradition is to respond, by doing something, reach out to a veteran or their families and let them know you care. If your tradition is to simply say thank you, then just give thanks. I will now, in silence, let us reflect on the meaning of the purple medal. Please remove your cover and bow your heads if you can. Let us pray. Lord, we come before you and ask to protect the millions of veterans who have served and are still serving today as well. Those that have earned a Purple Heart, we say thank you. To the millions of family members who live with the injured or with the memory of the lost, lost ones lost, we say thank you for your sacrifice. To the millions of personnel yet to be added to their numbers, we say thank you. May all these veterans be thanked for their courage, fearlessness, commitment, and to those with whom, whom they have served. And many blessings be upon all of us here today and continued blessings as we leave to our loved ones safely. We ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. <laughs>